the luxury Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City. It's just one year old and is famed for its ambitious architectural design. One sultry July evening, almost 1,500 people crowd inside the hotel's hallmark atrium for a tea dance. Suddenly, part of the building collapses, killing 114 people. It's the worst structural failure in US history. Now, using advanced computer simulation, we reveal what caused the Kansas City Hyatt collapse. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. The American Midwest, Missouri, Kansas City. 1978. To many outsiders, it's still a Midwestern backwater, best known for cattle trading. In reality, the city is emerging from the shadow of economic recession as a diverse commercial center. Kansas City authorities greenlight a major urban redevelopment scheme. A new $50 million luxury hotel, the Hyatt Regency. The project looks set to shake off the city's outdated cow town image. May 1978. Builders start work on the 150-meter-tall, 40-story Hyatt. As they begin phase one of the build, local engineering firm GCE, owned by Jack Gillum, is still finalizing the hotel's design. This new, fast-track approach means the project should be completed much more swiftly than a conventional build. Gillum has a 10-year track record of innovative building projects. But the Hyatt Corporation expects a groundbreaking architectural statement. Turning the vision into a reality will be one of his firm's biggest challenges yet. The hotel centerpiece will be its impressive 44 meter wide, 15 meter high, glass ceilinged atrium. Three suspended walkways will span this vast space, connecting guest rooms to a conference center and shopping complex. But then, 17 months in, there's a major setback. A section of the atrium's glass ceiling the size of a tennis court crashes to the ground. Engineer Jack Gillum analyzes the problem. He discovers that bolts connecting ceiling panels to the steel roof beams were wrongly installed. But he concludes that the accident is a one-off. July 1st, 1980. Despite the setbacks, the Kansas City Hyatt Regency Hotel opens on schedule. It's one of the city's most spectacular buildings. And the atrium's suspended walkways quickly become a major talking point. Your first impression was this large, open, airy space and these skywalks seemingly suspended in air. And people went, wow. Friday, July 17th, 1981. 6 p.m. In the 12 months since it opened, the Hyatt has become one of the city's top night spots. Tonight, 1,500 people crowd into the famous atrium for one of the hotel's most popular regular events. A 1940-style tea dance competition. As the dancers practice their moves, a TV crew arrives in the lobby. Reporter Michael Mahoney has worked for the local news station KMBC for a year. He's here to film a light-hearted feature item for the evening news. But it's not his idea of a major assignment. I hate features. I like hard news stories. And I took the job in Kansas City as an opportunity to get into a large American market and hopefully at some point I would work my way into what I was more comfortable with, which was a hard news story. On the other side of the lobby, engineer Walter Trueblood and his wife Shirley are enjoying their eighth tea dance at the Hyatt. They've shared a passion for dancing since they were teenage sweethearts courting in the 50s. As loyal customers, Walter and Shirley enjoy special benefits. 
The tea dance people had been kind enough to send us two free drink tickets, and I never turned down a free martini in my life. Local mortgage broker Frank Freeman is a first timer at the tea dance. He's here with his boyfriend of five years, Roger Grigsby. They've been looking forward to the dance for weeks, and Roger is in his element. He was an extrovert. There wasn't anybody he didn't know. Uh, he could talk to anybody, and you'd think he had known him for life, and he had just met him. Meanwhile, Walter and Shirley Trueblood decide against entering the competition. Instead, they join dozens of other couples crowding onto the first floor walkway, which offers a bird's eye view of the dance floor five meters below. 7.04 p.m. The band strikes up a popular foxtrot and the dance competition begins. Mike Mahoney's crew films the top shot from the first floor restaurant. On the first floor skywalk, Walter and Shirley Trueblood sway to the music, booming up from the atrium. Nine meters above them, dozens more watch from the third floor skywalk. On the lobby floor, directly underneath the skywalks, Frank Freeman and Roger Grigsby admire the competitors' moves. Seven o five p.m. In the restaurant on the first floor mezzanine, reporter Mike Mahoney's cameraman runs out of power. At that point, Dave was setting up his shot, and I reached over into our camera bag to uh, get some fresh batteries. Then Mahoney hears a noise from across the atrium. I heard this real sharp metallic pop, pop. And it was a sound that was so foreign to the environment that uh, I immediately looked up. There was a, a loud pop and the floor dropped about six to eight inches. I took Shirley's arm and said, I think we ought to step off. We took about three steps. Mike Mahoney traces the popping noise to the skywalks opposite him. I was uh, directly on level with the second walkway. And the second walkway began to sag and it took just a few seconds, but it seemed like forever at the moment. It sort of sagged down, and then all of a sudden, it just dropped. People watch in horror as the first and third floor glass and concrete skywalks plummet into the crowded lobby. The upper level came down, and the whole thing went down as an elevator. He looked at that and went, oh my God. Dozens of dancers and spectators lie dead, crushed beneath 65 tons of concrete and steel. Hundreds more are buried alive. Unless rescuers reach them fast, many more will die. Moments ago, local reporter Mike Mahoney was capturing these carefree images of a tea dance in Kansas City. Now his video camera records these horrific scenes of devastation. It was an awful scene. It was just terrible. There were people that were cut badly. There were people that were mutilated. There were people that had had limbs amputated. And there were people that had been trapped underneath these walkways, either smashed to the ground or sandwiched in between. And so it was a gruesome scene. Stunned survivors make frantic 911 calls. They, uh, they need uh, ambulances at the Hyatt Regency. Part of the lobby fell in on a whole bunch of people. Do you know how many injuries there are? There must be hundreds. 7.07 p.m. Two minutes since the collapse. Mortgage lender Frank Freeman is in shock. He and his boyfriend Roger were standing beneath the walkways when they collapsed. Frank has been hit on the back and shoulder by falling debris, but escaped being crushed by the narrowest of margins. When it was all said and done, I was facing the catwalks and the toes of my shoes were just barely touching the catwalks on the floor. There's no sign of Roger. A few meters away, 
lying under the remains of the first and third floor walkways, is property valuer Mark Williams. Just seconds ago, he was getting a drink at the bar. Now he's pinned to the floor under 65 tons of wreckage. My left leg was up behind my head and up here behind my right ear. My right leg was torn out of the socket and was also laying back up here behind me. So both of the legs are bent behind me and are up behind my head. Now engineer Walter Trueblood, who was on the first floor skywalk, regains his senses. There's a crushing weight on his chest. The only thing I could move was, was my arm enough to pull my tie off, so it give me a little more air. He has no idea where his wife Shirley is, or even if she survived. Seven seventeen. Firefighters and emergency personnel arrive. They swiftly set up a makeshift morgue in the hotel lobby. Outside, they turn the hotel's taxi rank into a treatment center. In his concrete tomb, Walter Trueblood has no idea if his wife Shirley is alive. Then, he hears something. The next voice I heard was good old Shirley saying, Walt, and uh, I asked her how she was doing. I remember Walter was calling me and wanting to know, you know, if I was all right. And we couldn't touch, but we could talk. Now, broken water pipes, severed by the collapse, pose a new threat to survivors. Water from the hotel's giant tanks is flooding the lobby at a rate of over 1,000 liters per minute. Under the rubble, hundreds of people who survived the collapse now face the prospect of drowning. Mark Williams can feel the water rising. I'm starting to breathe the water into my nose. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm on one of the highest points in the city of Kansas City and I'm gonna to drown to death. As Mark struggles to keep his head above water, Rescuers are helpless to stem the flow. Kansas City's fire chief pinpoints the problem. The hotel's front doors are acting like a dam, stopping the water in the lobby from escaping. He sends in bulldozers. They smash the doors down. Water starts to pour out of the lobby. To Mark Williams' huge relief, the water levels start to fall. 9.30. Over two hours since the collapse, Walter and Shirley Trueblood finally hear rescue workers nearby and shout for help. The rescue workers attach steel cables to the beam pinning Shirley to the floor and begin to lift it with a crane. They have to go slowly. One slip and the beam could kill her. They had been talking with us and I told them, I said, I feel like I'm about to faint. Would that be bad? And I remember him saying, oh lady, please hang on. He said, I'm almost there. At last, rescuers pull Shirley free. Just meters away, another team drags her husband Walter from the rubble, screaming in agony. 10 p.m. Frank Freeman, who was finally persuaded to leave the hotel, is getting treatment at a nearby medical center when a call comes in. Rescuers have found the body of a man. He fits Roger's description. They bring Frank a photo to make sure. And he didn't look. He, 
he didn't look like he'd been hit with anything. I mean, he had no cuts. There are no bruises. It looks like he was just laying there sleeping. And I said, what happened? And he, said, he had a broken neck. Two thirty a.m. Seven and a half hours after the collapse, now rescuers are only finding dead bodies. What they don't realize is that under the rubble, someone is still alive. But property valuer Mark Williams is buried so deep that he can't even hear the workmen above him. I'm getting mad. You know, why isn't somebody lifting this stuff off me? That's, I'd be organizing a group of people to lift this off of me. Then he hears something. Rescuers are drilling into the debris directly above him. I heard someone bang on something above my head, be it the Skywalk or whatever, and I started yelling, hey, I'm under here. But the noise of the jackhammers drowns out Mark's frantic cries. He survived the walkway collapse and the threat of drowning. Now Mark Williams faces the unthinkable, serious injury or even death at the hands of the rescue workers. The jackhammer comes through the rubble again and it goes between my legs. And now I'm thinking, they've triangulated me. The next one's coming right through the middle of my back and I got braced for it. Help! Then as the crew line up the jackhammer for another run, somebody finally hears Mark's desperate cries. Help! Somebody! Help! And I remember a guy saying, my God, there's somebody alive under here. 4.30 a.m. Firefighter Ray Wynn pulls Mark Williams from the pile of debris. Almost 10 hours after the collapse, he's the last person found alive, but he's horribly injured. You can see the soles of his shoes back here, and he sits up, and I'm like, wow, this guy's alive. I was happy, happy as hell to see him. Five a.m. An ambulance crew rushes Mark to hospital. He's still conscious, but his back is broken and his kidneys are failing. I do remember laying there and my mother asked the doctor, is he gonna live? And the doctor said, I don't think he's gonna make it. I sat up and I said, like hell I'm not gonna make it. I'm gonna be hunting ducks on October 27th when the season opens. The news, a special report. As Mark the Williams tragedy, undergoes emergency July surgery, 17th, the enormity of the Hyatt tragedy emerges. Who is responsible for the Hyatt Skywalk collapse? Because of the Hyatt disaster, Missouri State uh, officials lingers on in the lives of the survivors and the loved ones of the dead. 114 people have been killed. A further 186 are injured, many of them severely. It's the deadliest structural failure in American engineering history. Across the United States, people want answers. How can a key part of a prestigious public project like the Hyatt Hotel simply fall apart? Now, by rewinding the disaster and by going deep into the investigation, we reveal what really happened at the Kansas City Hyatt, how so many people died, and why the hotel's state-of-the-art skywalks gave way with such devastating consequences. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. Monday, July 20th, 1981. Three days after the disaster, relatives hold the first funerals for the victims. 
Kansas City is in mourning. Hyatt, the hotel operator, and the building's owner, the Crown Center Redevelopment Corporation, start their own investigations into the tragedy. But Kansas City's mayor, Richard Berkeley, wants an independent public inquiry. He asks the National Bureau of Standards to step in. The NBS is a highly regarded independent federal body that provides scientific analysis for the US government. But its investigation could take months. Local newspaper, the Kansas City Star, decides to shortcut the process. The paper wants a local structural engineer, Wayne Lischke, to become its undercover investigator. I was surprised by the phone call and a little apprehensive about, about taking the job. On one side, I wanted to do it because I wanted to get involved and see what, what really did happen. Lischke knows that the Hyatt was a fast-track project, completed in just under two and a half years. Did the speed of the construction cause shoddy workmanship? Or did faulty materials, defective steel, or poorly mixed concrete cause the collapse? If so, many more buildings under construction in booming Kansas City may be at risk. The answers lie in the rubble inside the Hyatt's atrium. Three days after the collapse, the building's owners decide to let the press inside the ruined atrium. But the reporters, among them undercover sleuth Wayne Lischke, soon find there's a catch. The journalists are only allowed to view the wreckage from 30 meters away. But the Kansas City Star guessed that Lischke might be kept at arm's length and hatched an ingenious plot. Lischke is armed with a secret weapon, a photographer with a telephoto lens. Lischke can see the tangled wreckage of the first and third floor walkways where they fell on the lobby floor. Overhead, all that remains of the original structure are six five-meter-long hangar rods still fixed to the ceiling. It's enough to allow Lischke to work out the walkway design. The upper walkway would have been suspended from the ceiling by this set of rods. Lischke realizes that there must have been a second set of rods bolted into the upper walkway that carried the lower walkway nine meters below. More importantly, the ceiling hanger rods are a crucial clue to where the failure happened. First thing that caught my eye was the rods were still hanging from the ceiling. Since the rods are intact, Lischke believes that the structure must have failed at the point where the upper walkway was connected to the hanger rods. Did a faulty fixing at this critical connection point fail? To find out, he would need to examine the wreckage more closely, something the builder's owners will not allow. Lischke hopes the photographs may reveal more, but now he has a brainwave. City Hall must hold a set of the hired blueprints. They'll detail the fixings used and may hold some clue to their apparent failure. But City Hall tells Lischke he can't see the blueprints. Librarians are in the process of cataloging them. His undercover investigation for the Kansas City Star hits a brick wall. While Lischke's sleuthing stalls, the official investigation gets into gear. A team of four scientists from the National Bureau of Standards flies into Kansas City. Among them is lead investigator Edward Frank. His first priority, to examine the Hyatt's collapsed walkways. But when he arrives at the Hyatt, Frank and his MBS team are shocked and baffled by what they find. The lobby is empty. 
the wreckage of the walkways and the crucial evidence it contains have disappeared. Scientists flown in from the National Bureau of Standards, or NBS, to investigate the Hyatt Regency Skywalk collapse have hit a problem. The walkway wreckage has gone. The building's owners have taken it away for private analysis. For lead investigator Dr. Edward Frank, chief of the Bureau's structures division, it's a massive blow. Uh, of course, as you know, the debris has been moved. We have not had a chance to see that. We were shocked to have it removed. Uh, and very disappointed. Frank immediately petitions the circuit court of Jackson County for access to the wreckage which lies in a warehouse downtown. If the court denies the MBS request, its independent investigation of the Hyatt disaster is dead in the water. The NBS team starts to examine eyewitness accounts for clues to the cause of the collapse. Many say that the Hyatt's walkways were overcrowded that evening. They were encouraging people to dance in the walkways. They just said, use the entire lobby as a dance floor, which everybody was doing. Some experts say that people dancing on the walkways may have put them under unforeseen stress. All of a sudden, areas that were meant for people walking from the elevator to a restaurant became dance floors, and I think that's absolutely mad. Pat Foley, Hyatt Hotel's president, rebuts the claims that the walkways were overloaded. The catwalks are designed to hold people shoulder to shoulder, as many as you can jam on there. NBS investigators examine Kansas City's building codes. They find the codes require public structures to be capable of carrying a load of 488 kilograms per square meter. The first and third floor walkways should have been strong enough to carry at least 1,280 people. But no one knows exactly how many people it held that evening. Then, MBS investigators get a break. They learn of news reporter Mike Mahoney's unique footage of the tea dance on the night of the disaster. Investigators pore over the footage. They discover that several of Mahoney's shots focus on the famous skywalks. It's like being given that information on a silver platter. It was very, very, very useful. Investigators work out that at the time of the collapse, there were 40 people on the first floor walkway and 23 on the third floor walkway, 63 in total. They calculate that 63 people would only exert a load of 83 kilograms per square meter, a fraction of the possible maximum load. The number of people alone is clearly not enough to overload the walkway. But could just 63 people still trigger disaster if enough of them were dancing on the walkways? In 1940, News cameras captured the Tacoma Narrows Bridge tearing itself apart. High winds created a violent swaying motion in the structure, ultimately causing the bridge to collapse. It's an extreme example of what engineers call harmonic vibration. Now the NBS asks, could people swaying on the Hyatt walkway have created a similar effect? Experts know that all structures, however solid, vibrate imperceptibly at their own individual frequency. If the people on the walkway were moving at the same frequency, it could cause harmonic vibration. That would set up a wave motion in the walkway that could deform the structure and ultimately cause it to fail. To determine if harmonic vibration did cause the collapse, the NBS team needs to establish the natural frequency of the walkways and the treading frequency of people they carried, the tempo at which they were dancing or swaying to the music. Investigators learned that the band was playing a popular foxtrot at the time of the collapse. When they analyze the tune, they discover it has a treading frequency of 1.1 hertz, or beats, per second. 
they compare it to the natural frequency of the surviving, identical, second floor walkway. They discover that its natural frequency is 7.1 Hz, more than six times faster. Since the two frequencies are different, harmonic vibration cannot be a factor in the disaster. It's a dead end. The MBS investigation stalls. Meanwhile, engineer Wayne Lischke's unofficial investigation for the Kansas City Star gets a shot in the arm. The hired building plans are now back at City Hall after cataloging. He hopes they might hold some clue to the walkway's collapse. But what he finds in City Hall comes as a bombshell. I was shocked at that point in time. It literally only took seconds to realize that what was on the plans and what was built in the field were not the same thing. The design plans filed by Jack Gillum's engineering firm, GCE, show the first and third floor walkways hanging from the ceiling by a series of 14 meter long hangar rods. But Lischke knows from his visit to the Hyatt that this is not how the walkways were actually built. The rods still hanging from the ceiling were simply not long enough to reach the lower walkway. A second set of rods bolted into the upper walkway must have carried its twin below. He's already deduced that the structure failed at the point where the upper walkway was connected to the ceiling rods. Now he's beginning to understand why. According to the plans, this critical connection point was only meant to bear the weight of the upper walkway. In the built structure, it carries the weight of the lower walkway as well, twice its intended load. Lishka needs to know, did engineer Jack Gillum change the connection point design to take account of this extra load? Hours later, the newly developed photographs of the walkway wreckage give him his answer. They clearly show that several of the upper walkway connection points have dramatically failed. Three cross beams form the walkway's basic structure. At the connection point, the hanger rods pass through the end of each beam or channel and are secured by a nut underneath. It's starkly obvious to Lischke why this connection point design was not up to the task. These are basically two eight-inch channels similar to the ones that were used in the Skywalk. Normally, if you wanted to make a walkway out of two channels, what they would have done is turned them back to back and taken the rod and put it in between. On the Hyatt, what they did is they took two channels and they turned them toe to toe and then they welded them to form a box beam. Welding the two pieces together makes it very weak right, right through here. Welded box beams were adequate to provide the walkway's basic framework. But using them to form the connection point poses a serious problem. Here, they must bear the entire load of both walkways. But the nature of their structure transfers these huge forces to the beam's weakest and thinnest points, its walls. Lischke believes the connection point design was a recipe for disaster. Putting two channels toe to toe is a, is a ludicrous way to do it. It was then and, and is now. Lischke publishes his findings in the Kansas City Star. If he's right, then the collapse was not caused by faulty materials, but by bad design. But without access to the walkways themselves, it remains no more than an intriguing theory. Then, 12 days after the collapse, the Circuit Court of Jackson County issues a crucial judgment. It grants the NBS investigation team access to the remains of the walkways locked up in a Kansas City warehouse. The investigator's first priority, to confirm where the walkways gave way. Amid the wreckage of the upper walkway, 
they unearth all six of its critical connection points and make a disturbing discovery. On each of them, the welds on the box beam have folded inwards and upwards, allowing the hanger rod to pull right through. One box beam, named 9UE, shows signs of longer term damage than the others, suggesting it gave way first. It looks as though Lishka was right. The box beam design of the connection points was the walkway's Achilles heel. Well, just looking at the box beams, you know, you have to shake your head and say, I sure wouldn't do it that way. Both Lishka and Frang think a failure in the box beam connections is the cause of the disaster. But unlike Lishka, Frang can put the theory to the test. In the National Engineering Laboratory in Gaithersburg, Maryland, investigators attach steel box beams to hanger rods to make two exact replicas of the connection point. They weigh every scrap of walkway debris and calculate that the total load on the connection was 8,150 kilograms, over eight tons. First, they want to find out if the critical connection point was able to take the weight of the walkways without people. The scientists subject the first replica to a constant eight tons of load. Four seconds in, there's no change. 20 seconds in, they detect movement. After 52 seconds, it stops. Under the weight of walkways alone, the walls of the beam start to bow. But the connection does not give way. But investigators know that there were 63 people on the walkways when they fell. They estimate that this would add an extra ton, bringing the total load to just over nine tons. They repeat the experiment with a second identical connection. This time, they'll gradually add the extra weight to observe exactly what happens to the connection points. At 8,070 kilograms, the side walls distort further and the base starts to give way. At 8,160 kilograms, the weld gives way with a crack. Then, at 8,255 kilograms, it fails completely. The base of the connection, the point bearing the greatest stress, simply folds like cardboard. The bolt attaching the walkway to its hanger rod rips clean through. Under a steady mechanically exerted force, the connection actually gives way some 815 kilograms short of the estimated load. The NBS conclusion is clear cut and deeply shocking. The third floor walkway connections were nowhere near strong enough to carry the weight of two walkways and people. In fact, they were so weak they had just one third of the load capacity required by Kansas City building codes. From the day that they were put up, they were a disaster waiting to happen. The investigation takes 10 months. It reveals in chilling detail exactly what caused two walkways to tear loose from their supports high above a crowded dance floor, leaving 114 Friday night revelers seconds from disaster. Seven p.m. Five minutes to disaster. The Hyatt's Friday night tea dance buzzes with 1,500 partygoers. Dozens of people flock onto the third floor walkway to escape the throng. But beneath their feet, the walkway's six connection points struggle to carry the nine-ton load. At the walkway's eastern end, the connection point at the end of box beam 9UE has been gradually deforming for 16 months. 
Beneath the walkways, people are totally unaware of the danger overhead. 7.04 p.m. One minute to disaster. Shirley and Walter Trueblood join the crowd on the first floor walkway. Seconds later, the base of Boxbeam 9UE buckles. As its welds snap, people hear the popping from up to 30 meters away. As the base of the beam folds, the hanger rod rips free. As the restraining nut smashes into the top of the beam above with a sharp crack, the walkways jolt down sharply. Two seconds later, disaster strikes. Box beam 9UE fails. The five remaining connections on the third floor instantaneously unzip. The third floor walkway plummets down at over 15 meters per second. 65 tons of concrete and steel crashes to the lobby floor in just 1.6 seconds. A fatal flaw in the construction of the walkways is responsible for the deaths of 114 people. The job of the MBS team was solely to explain the technical reasons for the collapse. But the victims of the tragedy still want answers to the wider questions. How could a public structure be built without anyone realizing it was not up to the job? And who was to blame for the walkway's fatal flaw? The full story would emerge in a series of sensational court cases that took place in the wake of the disaster. What they revealed would shock America and transform the way buildings are built and designed in the U.S. forever. Official investigators have revealed that the Kansas City Hyatt Skywalks collapsed because the way they were connected to hanging rods was fatally flawed. The critical connection points had just one-third of the load capacity required. The spotlight now falls on Jack Gillum, head of engineering firm GCE, which designed the Hyatt. In the wake of the collapse, the American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE, and the Missouri State Board investigate Gillum's role. It emerges that it was the Hyatt architects who requested box beams for the walkways. Their motives were aesthetic. Box beams are the easiest type of beam to conceal with plasterboard. But as chief engineer, it was Gillum's job to ensure that all aspects of the walkway were structurally sound. So what went wrong? Jack Gillum tells investigators that one year into the Hyatt build, his firm, GCE, sent drawings of the walkway and its connection points to the fabricator, Haven Steel. Haven Steel says that the single hanger rod design is too hard to build and proposes two sets of rods instead. One month later, GCE gives the new walkway design its stamp of approval. Investigators are mystified. Gillum's concept for the connection point is flawed from the start, and the new design doubles the load it will carry. But at no stage does GCE attempt to rectify the problem. Why wasn't the mistake spotted? Now Gillum makes a staggering admission. Nobody at GCE ran any calculations on the strength of the walkway connections. He maintains that it's custom and practice in Missouri for the fabricator to do the calculations, while Haven Steel insists that it's the engineer's job to check the design. And investigators discover that Gillum had another opportunity to avert catastrophe. When part of the atrium ceiling collapsed during the build, Gillum's firm did check connections in the atrium, but nobody checked the walkway connections. If they had, it's almost certain the problem would have come to light. The ASCE suspends Gillum. After five years of litigation, the Missouri State Board holds GCE responsible for the collapse and revokes Gillum's license to practice in the state of Missouri. 
Gillam believes that his firm GCE behaved correctly, but accepts that the bug stops with the engineer of record and takes ultimate responsibility for the mistake. The Kansas City Star won a Pulitzer Prize for Wayne Lischke's reports on the Hyatt Skywalk collapse. Lischke still works as an engineer in Kansas City. Mark Williams spent two months in intensive care and endured many months more of painful rehabilitation. But on the opening day of the duck hunting season... I made it. My physical therapist carried me on his back through the marsh, got me to the, to the duck blind opening day. Despite suffering a broken back and having both legs torn out of their sockets, Mark made a complete recovery. Walter and Shirley Trueblood also recovered from their serious injuries. They're still keen dancers. The Hyatt Skywalks disaster transformed engineering safety in the United States. In the wake of the tragedy, Kansas City completely overhauled its building regulations, requiring that all load-bearing calculations be checked by a city-appointed engineer. And the American Society of Civil Engineers rewrote its rules to send a clear message to structural engineers. You are responsible for the plans that carry your stamp. Today, the Kansas City Hyatt has been transformed. It no longer has suspended walkways. In their place stands a single span, supported by sturdy columns, aimed at instilling a renewed sense of safety and security in those who pass through the now historic site.